thank you for coming tonight. I feel like I should be in the audience and everyone here should be telling me their stories. I'm honored to be here. First, I'd like to say I'm honored to be a part of this incredible book. The questions how transracial adoptees, their families, women and children are marginalized nationally and internationally. In my chapter, I describe my family's story and how my brother didn't survive what is not unfamiliar to many adoptees. Isolation, racism, drug use, AIDS, and time spent in correctional facilities and or prison. We were raised in a segregated South Minneapolis in the 1960s and 70s. The home we were raised in east of Chicago Avenue and 48th Street had a racially restricted covenant on it saying only white people could live and own homes in this area. Reinforcing segregated housing patterns, the Minneapolis public schools drew boundary lines the overcrowded the schools attended largely but not solely by children of color, adding portables or violating city safety codes in order to prevent white resistance to race mixing. Inadequate access to decent parks and housing led some Minneapolis parents to support school desegregation in the late 1960s in my neighborhood. But busing proved no cure and Minneapolis today still reflects the segregated foundation it was built on for the price of homes east of Chicago Avenue and west of Nicollet Avenue are much higher than the few neighbor, neighborhoods where people of color were once restricted to legally or through what were called gentlemen's agreements. 35 years later, fair housing and how our children are surviving or not are still the biggest challenges of our time. Ultimately, tonight, I'm reading a portion of my chapter to keep alive the story of my brother and our life, not to forget Michael Todd Addison. My chapter is entitled Tending Denial. My brother's name was Jerome and then Jomi. Mom wrote in his baby book that when she and my father adopted him, they changed his name to Michael. My parents hoped to have him home by Christmas, but it took four months more until he was 18 months old. Mom said she was warned that the first month would be difficult. Although Mike was a good eater, most of his food went right through him, and, any morning, and many mornings they'd wake to the result of his nerves undone, his diaper full to overflowing. Since she couldn't nurse him, Mom rocked him to sleep nightly, singing Michael, World of Boda Shore, Hallelujah. We were his fifth home, and he wasn't yet two years old. I was five. Why did your parents adopt, transracially people ask. As an employee of Lutheran Social Service in the mid-1960s, Mom saw a disproportionate number of black children on the county adoption list. She and my dad talked it over and decided to adopt. Less than three years later, they divorced. In 1969, the Minneapolis Public School Board was debating desegregation and busing. They proposed that two schools in our neighborhood, quote unquote, pair, equally dividing the grades and busing the children between two schools. Due to the segre segregated housing patterns in Minneapolis, our nearly all-white school was just 15 blocks away from another school that was 54% black, when less than 10% of the children in the Minneapolis Public Schools were children of color. There was great resistance to the proposed busing in our neighborhood. Mom supported it publicly, and that was when the harassment began. At the podium at Hale School, Mom spoke out for Minnesota's first attempt at busing. Adults in the audience jeered. She's the one with the little nigger baby. When my two young brothers and I left for school in the morning, more than one stalker called my mom to say, I see your little nigger baby at the bus stop. When Mom arrived home, another caller noted where she had been and with whom. She reported it to the police, she tells me today but they never discovered who the callers were. I remember a little, but there was one call I never forgot. Mom tried to protect us. The foul ringing of the phone wakes me at 4 a.m. Mom rises, and I hear her king-size bed groan from her departure. The narrow floorboards creak as she walks to where the rotary dial phone sits on a ledge above the stairs. I hear her say a muffled hello. I lie in my lower bunk in my bedroom alone, wrapped up in Mom and my bedding. A dim light glows from the bathroom further down the hall. I hold my breath. She does not scream, leave me alone, into the phone. She responds so quietly I can't hear her. Then hangs up the phone and sighs discreetly. I lie in my bed hoping to drift off reassured into the safe place of sleep, hoping to hear her lie back down in her bed. Instead, the closet door hinges give as she reaches in and takes out her bathrobe in the darkness. I hear it brush against the belts and scarves hanging neatly in the door. Her hushed feet pass by my room, and I can see her grab hold of the wrought iron handrail and lean onto it for support as she goes downstairs for a cigarette, a cloudy reprieve. I remember the phone call as if it were a nightmare, a nightmare we wouldn't normally discuss, but that one call we did talk about when I was a kid. 
It was from a man who threatened to break into our home in the middle of the night. Mom only had to tell me once for me to remember forever what he said. I'm coming in your basement window. She had hung up on him, but not without saying, the hell you are, bastard. She told me this boldly. That, that she, <laughs> she denies telling me this today. <laughs> but I have to say that we, every person in the family remembers their own truth. <laughs> Maybe I heard her telling somebody else. <laughs> She told me this boldly as if to convince us both there what, that she wasn't worried, that she had it under control. But even at eight, there was no misinterpreting her lucid fear, no matter how tough my mom tried to be. Listening for a noise from the basement, I could imagine her lying in her bed, trying to silence the pounding explosion within her chest. The next morning, as if it were just another day, we all left for school or work, relieved for the routine events of our lives. The man mom was dating was called too. He was told, go to the hospital right now. Your girlfriend has had a terrible accident lies. Another time the phone rang immediately after he'd walked into his apartment. After dinner with mom, someone called him to say, look out the window at your car in the parking lot. His car was on fire. It had been firebombed, torched. My brother's birth father was African American and his mother was white, European. And that's what my parents wanted. Mom tried to support mom's racial identity, affirmed that it included both races, that he was white too, that he was biracial. She had his birth record that showed that his mother was Irish and Scottish. Mike's birth mother said she didn't know his father's name, but she loved him. And I'm going to end with a quote from 1972 from the National Association of Black Social Workers. We full, fully recognize the phenomenon of transracial adoption as an expedient for white folk, not as an altruistic, humane concern for black children. The supply of white children for adoption has all but vanished. And adoption agencies, having always catered to middle class whites, developed an answer to their desire for parenthood by motivating them to consider black children. This has brought about a redefinition of some black children. Those born of black-white alliances are no longer black as decreed by immutable law and social customs for centuries. They are now black-white, interracial, biracial, emphasizing the whiteness as the adoptable quality. A further subtle but vicious design to further diminish black and accentuate white. We resent this high-handed arrogance and are insulted by this further assignment of chattel status to black people. Thank you.